Hey guys, it's Miss Reed from Citizenship Academy in Syracuse. Today you are on Personal Narratives Unit 1, Lesson 8. So today you are going to compare facts from first-hand account and second-hand accounts. We're going to talk about that today. Um, and you are going to finish planning personal narratives using strong details in your writing. So before we begin, I just want to go over what a first-hand and second-hand account is. So a first-hand account is a version of a story or event written or told by a person who actually experienced it. When you get older, you'll also find that this is called a primary source, a primary resource, primary source. So a first-hand account is me telling the story of when I jumped off the cliff in um, Zimbabwe, right? And also a firsthand account is the story of Peg telling what happened to her when she got polio. Today, Mrs. Miss K from um, the other senior school is going to read a secondhand account um, of, of um, it's not really a story, but it's more of like an informational text about polio. And this is a version of a story event written by someone who did not experience it. But this person got information from books, people who did experience it or other sources. So this would be like if I were going to tell you a story about um, the Vietnam War, right? Um, I wasn't there. I wasn't even alive then. So it can't be a firsthand account. That's a secondhand account because I'm telling you based off of what I've read and what I've heard, right? So firsthand person is like, firsthand account is like you heard it straight from the person who experienced it. Secondhand account is you're getting information from someone who did a lot of research, from someone who studied it, but from somebody who didn't necessarily live it. So we're going to read an informational text about polio so you can get a little bit of background knowledge. Um, as you read, I want you to think about how this is kind of similar to what we're going through right now um, with the coronavirus um, pandemic in our country because it is pretty similar when you stop and think about it. Uh, but I'm not going to read it to you. I will pop back on after Miss K is finished. We are going to do our read aloud. And this is that nonfiction informational text um, about polio. So this is the introduction to polio. Polio is a serious and contagious illness caused by a virus. The polio virus spreads through contact with feces or less commonly being coughed on or sneezed on. Most people infected with the virus have no symptoms. For others, it results in flu-like symptoms such as fever, sore throat, nausea, headache, and tiredness. But when the polio virus affects the brain and spinal cord, it is very serious and can cause severe symptoms, including muscle weakness and paralysis, which may be temporary or permanent. While polio can infect anyone, it mostly affects children. Stories and drawings from as early as the year 1500 BCE suggest that people have gotten sick with polio for a long time. In 1789, British physician Michael Underwood published the first description in medical literature, and in 1840, a German doctor named it infantile paralysis. Polio epidemics increased in the late 1800s, and polio epidemics occurred regularly in the United States throughout the first half of the 20th century. Because polio is so contagious, these epidemics were very frightening and communities treated the threat very seriously. Swimming pools closed and children were not allowed in other public gathering places such as movie theaters. In the summer, when polio epidemics were most likely to occur, some parents kept their children indoors or made them wear gloves. So very similar to what we're One going through right now. One of the most famous polio patients was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Oh, she paused. I should have. I knew that was going to happen. And I let it happen. Delano Roosevelt. In 1921, when he was 39 years old and already an important and well-known politician, he developed polio. While he recovered and worked hard on rehabilitation, his legs were permanently paralyzed. Even so, he was elected president in 1932 and led the United States through the Great Depression and much of World War II. During his presidency, he created the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, later called the March of Dimes, which raised money to help polio patients and to research a vaccine or cure for polio. The March of Dimes funded research by two main scientists, Dr. Jonas Selk 
and Dr. Albert Sabin. We're both working on inventing vaccines, but using different approaches. Dr. Self's vaccine was ready in first in 1953. He was so sure of his vaccine that he started by testing it on himself and his family. Some of his lab workers also chose to have it tested on themselves. The results were promising, no one got sick, and everyone developed polio antibodies. In 1954, Dr. Selk and his researchers vaccinated almost 2 million healthy school children. A year later, the results were in, the vaccine worked. Over the next two years, polio rates in the United States fell over 80%. Soon after, in 1959, Dr. Albert Sabin's version of the vaccine was also proven safe and effective. Both Dr. Salk and Dr. Sabin chose to make the details of their research and how to manufacture their vaccines public. If they had chosen to keep it a secret, they might have made a lot of money selling their vaccines. But they decided it was important to share so that the vaccines could be produced and distributed as quickly and as inexpensively as possible. Today, thanks to vaccination, polio has been eliminated in the Western Hemisphere, which includes the United States, Mexico, Canada, Europe, and South and Central America. While polio is still present in a few countries, including Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria, programs dedicated to vaccination are working hard to wipe out polio worldwide. Okay. So number eight asks, of the two texts you read yesterday, the diagnosis, and today we read Introduction to Polio, was either one a first-hand account? Number nine was either a second-hand account? Number 10, which is not... And you don't have to answer these questions, so you don't need to worry about this. But it is um, good for you to be thinking. We're going to continue to talk about types of details to include in your writing. So yesterday I had you um, brain, right? You went through these brainstorm topics. You picked one that you were going to write about, and then you wrote about it in the time order, and you wrote about it in chronological order by breaking it down into events that happened. Um, remember I used the example of mine where I was jumping off the cliff in um, Zimbabwe. So today, you're going to use that event. You're going to take that event. So you might actually have to look back at your work from yesterday. You can do that um, in Seesaw by going to um, your journal and clicking on that. And you can see all of your old work. I'll show you how to do that at the end of this video as well because that might be a little bit confusing. So these are different types of details to include in your writing. And that's what we're going to do today is take each one of those events that you listed in your um, – that you listed yesterday – for your work in Seesaw, and you're going to add details to them so that you can flesh this out into a full-blown story. So these are good details to include in your writing. What something looks like, what something feels like to touch, what something sounds like. Ooh, are these ringing a bell? These are sensory details, right? What something smells or tastes like, a physical action. What is somebody actually physically doing? What did somebody actually do in the text? A quote of what someone said. So you can write, what does somebody actually say? Um, remember, that's called dialogue. Or how someone felt physically or emotionally. So in your work, you're going to have a chart that looks just like this. You are going, don't worry about the page numbers. That's for people who are in class. Um, you are going to use your events from yesterday. So these events that you did um, and you wrote down, remember you were like one, two, three, four, you wrote those down, you're going to write out each event. So my first event right here, and I'm going to write it next to it, was um, I walked down, this is going to mess up my page, but it's okay. I walked down to the Zambezi River with my friends um, to get into the river raft. Right? Major characters and traits they showed. So um, I could say, like, I was being, like, I'm a major character, right? So myself and my friends, we were being adventurous. Like, I was showing I was adventurous. I was about to go, I'm just spelling adventurous wrong, and it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, we were being adventurous and um, brave by going on the on the river raft. Physical actions. Um what were we doing? So we were walking down, like we had to kind of like hike 
we were hiking to the trail, hiking down the trail to the river. So that was our physical actions. Um, important objects. So we could say we had to get our life jacket. Um, I don't know, other sensory details. Okay, so one good sensory detail is that I could hear the like thunder of the, like the thunderous um, river, like from up on, from when I was walking down the hill. So I knew that the river is really powerful. Hear the thunderous river. Um, what is that? Like going, like splat, splashing, like splashing. Oh, the river running. What am I talking about? The river was running. Hear the thunders were running as I was walking down the hill, right? So I knew it was really powerful because it was like fun. It sounded so loud as I was hiking. So you can see I'm adding these um, sensory details. I could say too, like I was like kind of getting a little shaky because I was nervous, but I was also exciting. Exciting. That could be my feelings, right? So I was a little nervous and shaky, but I was also really excited. So see how I'm filling out like as much of this as I can about each event in my narrative. In my narrative. So I was a little nervous and shaky, but I was also really excited. Um, dialogue or things people said. So my friends and I were kind of like anxiously like talking to each other about how excited we were, um, about how the river was so loud. So we were talking anxiously about how the river was loud, how we've never done this before, et cetera, right? Um, and I went down to the next, there's another page too, but I went over. So, um, if there's something like this, important objects and details about them, like, I don't really think that I, I mean, I guess I could include that, like, I was carrying an oar. I mean, that's kind of important because it got me down the river. But if there's something that doesn't work, like, if there's an important, if there aren't any objects that are taking place in this event of your story, you don't have to include that. So, do include as much detail as you can because this is what's going to make your story actually interesting to read. So next to your events, you're going to write what the actual event is. So this one is I walked down to the Zambezi River, right? This is just the first event in my story. So then the next part would be um, the next event is we got on our life jackets and the guide explained um, like what the journey would be like. So he told us like what kind of rapids we would hit and whatnot. So I'm going to list out every event and I'm going to write these things. So who are the major characters in here? Um, myself, the guide, right? Um, what was he doing? He was showing us how to paddle. So you're going to do the same thing in Seesaw. So you have, when you when you go, you'll obviously see this presentation, but you'll click on this and it looks exactly the same. So next to the event, make sure you're writing um, what it is. You can use text boxes. You can use writing utensils. You can try to record yourself um, if it won't work for you to write it. So I'm looking forward to reading a little bit more in depth about your narratives.